Good evening and a very warm welcome to Hartford College Chapel at Home, from our home to yours for our Trinity Sunday Evening Song. The doctrine of the Trinity is theologically complex, but at its heart it speaks of the perfect community of love which exists in the God who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. This week, what it means to live in complete harmony and love has been on our minds, as events in the aftermath of the death of George Floyd have unfolded. Tonight, our Bible readings touch on this, as we look in Isaiah 6 at the prophet's struggle with his own inadequacy in the face of a God who is three times holy, who calls him to action. In Luke 15, we learn from the story of the lost sheep that although all 100 sheep have value, the sheep most at risk is the sheep who particularly matters to God. And we'll go on to examine ourselves in the light of Martin Luther King Jr's powerful prayers. I'm pleased to introduce to you our preacher tonight. It's the Venerable Paul Thomas, the Archdeacon of Salop in the Diocese of Lichfield. And finally, our music for the service. Our canticles tonight are Wormsley in D minor. They're sung by our chapel choir and by the choir of St. Dennis Lisbane. Our responses are by Rose and choir and team will be singing Tchaikovsky's beautiful hymn to the Trinity. But before we begin, I'd like to introduce you to Antonia. Antonia is a first year geography student at Hartford College and a couple of days ago, I caught up with her to talk about what normal looks like for her and what kind of normal she is hoping to see. Antonia, over to you. Hi, so I assume that others talking to the theme of normal have talked about COVID-19, so I thought I could use the topic to talk to my back experience. So the other day I was on my daily exercise, I was just walking around my village and I came to the end of the alleyway near my house and I saw this small girl and her mum and the small girl was staring at me really like deeply and inquisitively and um, her mum was turning her away and her mum was avoiding eye contact and trying to get her to face away so that I could walk past and I realised that this is the first time that um, I was sure that this was because of the virus because of social distancing and not something to do with me specifically because usually these encounters these encounters that I've had for a long time in my nearly all white vi village that I've lived in for 11 years these encounters are usually because of, because of my skin because some small child has come up to me and has never seen a black person up close before and similarly similarly to the covid encounter interestingly i felt guilty guilty for putting these poor kids parents in a difficult situation difficult scenario to navigate and guilty for like existing in this space and these people's white space for guilty for existing while black so in that sense, my black experience has been just, it's been characterised by being apologetically black. That's been normal for me. Just putting on the whitest accent that I can whenever I see old people and need to speak to them in the street. Being terrified of slipping into the loud black girl trope that I was scared of, like really scared of in secondary school. Um... I'm just being scared to speak up to my issues and experiences for fear of making these like the white communities I grew up with and ended up in uncomfortable. Even now at uni, um, I'm not quite sure about this, but I think I might be the only African girl in my year at college and one of if not only the Af the if one of if not the only one in my subject. So <laughs> um I hope it's just an unfortunate coincidence, but it's probably not but um yeah so I've just always felt like a representative in that sense and because of that my black experience has been defined by hiding that um and shying away from so many parts of myself in order to fit into this image of the model black girl black friend black neighbor student and just not contesting that because of fear of rocking the boat and making these communities uncomfortable so in terms of the new normal Coming out of the, the end, the other end of this flare up of the Black Lives Matter movement in this country, which has always existed, but um, more than anything, 
the first thing I'd like to see is just just widespread acknowledgement and awareness of the problem here in the UK. Um, acknowledgement of the systemic racism and white privilege which define the lives and experiences of all of us in this country and across the world and not just excluding it as somewhere else's problem. I want to see people accepting their role in perpetuating the systems which eventually culminate in tragic events such as the loss of countless lives at the hands of institutions. And mostly I'd just like to see people being open to conversation and solutions which may sound as equally radical as they may be necessary. Um, because in order to tackle systemic and instituted frameworks of oppression, we need systemic and instituted frameworks of change, which has to be intrusive and it's going to be difficult. But the conversations need to be continued in the wake of these events and not just diffused for to try and get back to the old normal. Um, and I think the most important thing is, that I would like to see is just people be willing, being open and willing to accept being wrong and to constructively, constructively respond to it because it's inevitable to be wrong, but non-black people need to be open and, and understanding to the fact that they might not understand the experience and everything that's going on because they haven't experienced it. So just to be willing to learn in response to that. And going back to COVID again, <laughs> um, people are starting to realise that after the COVID-19 pandemic has died down a bit, society has an opportunity to, to change um, in terms of the climate, employment, precarity, treatment of key workers. Um, and people think that we should ideally take this opportunity um, and this brief moment of attention and light for the Black Lives Matter movement should be the same. It should be an opportunity to suggest, listen to and implement change and not just return to the old normal of silent black voices.
The first lesson is taken from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 6, beginning at the first verse. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. Here ends the first lesson. The second lesson is taken from the Gospel according to St Luke, chapter 15, beginning at the first verse. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I've found my lost sheep. I tell you, that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Here ends the second lesson.
Thomas the Archdeacon of Salop and I'm very pleased to be part of your service on this Trinity Sunday. Now may I speak in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The doctrine of the Trinity has often been regarded like Bertha, Edward Rochester's first wife, the mad wife in the attic. Christians tried on the whole never to bring her out into the open and although she appeared now and again when no one was looking, for example in the baptism service or in the prayer of blessing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, still no one really wanted to talk about her. You can read whole tomes of 19th century theology without ever being confronted with the idea that Christians believe that God is three in one. And Sheila Marker, even relegated the Trinity to the appendix of his great work. Quite a few wouldn't mind if it stayed that way today. It's not in the Bible, they say, and it doesn't make sense anyway. As for not being in the Bible, my Oxford tutor, Anthony Harvey, used to say that the doctrine of the Trinity is overheard in the New Testament. All three names are there, Father, Son, Spirit, 
but they don't get connected up in any consistent way. They seem to represent three separate threads of the Christian experience of God and weaving them together belong to a future age. It belonged, in fact, to the next 400 years, because that is about as long as it took the Church to get its act together on the Trinity. They had been fine with talk about God the Father, because that seemed to coincide with a lot of the Old Testament and its ideas of God as creator and sustainer. God the Son took longer, because they had to sort out if Jesus of Nazareth who had gone about doing good and healing all manner of sickness, as Luke put it, did all that in a unique relationship with God, or as just another spokesperson of the supernatural world. If Jesus was the human face of God, then his identity was both human and divine, and no account of who God is could leave him out. The last one to gain proper attention was the Holy Spirit. The impersonal imagery of the Bible, like wind or water, tended to keep the Spirit outside the sphere of God's being, even though John's Gospel offered plenty of hints to the contrary. When eventually the penny dropped, Christian theologians realised that the Spirit too deserved to be treated as God, sharing fully in the divine status. Having got that far, the Church now had to decide how to make sense of God as Father, Son and Spirit without ending up with three gods instead of one. And here the Church in the West and the Church in the East went in different directions. In the West, Augustine went for what we might call a psychological model in which the Father, Son and Spirit related very much like the different levels of a human personality. The mind has memory, understanding and will, but it is still just one mind. It was all important to Augustine that we preserve God's oneness, because that was how the dominant Greco-Roman philosophy of his time conceived of God, dismissing, dismissing any talk of a plurality of gods. In the East, away from the pressure, a group called the Cappadocian Fathers were more relaxed about each of the persons, Father, Son and Spirit, relating to each other more freely. They followed a social model of the Trinity, which made it easier to think of God enjoying the experience of being God's self with a rich exchange of love between all three persons, a heavenly community sharing a full, flourishing and overflowing life of harmonious togetherness. But whether theologians have written about the psychological model or the social model of the Trinity, their aim has been exactly the same. They've wanted to underline the truth that God is love. Not just that God is loving towards us, as we can all be towards others on good days, but that God is love right through to the very core of God's being. Any love which comes our way from God and there is certainly plenty of that when we stop to think about it, springs from the internal relations of Father, Son and Spirit and the mutual love they have expressed towards one another from all eternity. This means the Trinity is first and foremost not about information, but about invitation. There is a famous icon painted by Rublev, a Russian artist, early in the 15th century. It depicts three figures sat round a table. All three have identical faces and they all wear something blue, the colour of the heavens. The figure at the centre is God the Son, and both he and the figure on the right, who represents the Spirit, look lovingly towards the figure sat on the left, who is the Father. Between the three figures is a cup positioned at the front of a table, suggesting that they are feasting together. And then in front of the cup, there is a gap, an opening in the circle, which beckons the onlooker to step forward and participate. Come and join the feast is the invitation. Come and join the feast of God's love, which will satisfy your deepest needs. Come and be part of the eternal communion of Father, Son and Spirit. We 
we can thank the Cappadocian Fathers for inspiring that beautiful portrayal of God. But here's a final portrayal to do justice to Augustine. The French composer Ravel wrote a very dynamic piece of music called Bolero. It is said that he derived the original inspiration from a dance he witnessed in an Andalusian inn. As the pace of the music increased, a woman leapt onto a table spinning round and round, gradually drawing everyone else into the harmony of her dynamic movements. Likewise, at the heart of all creation, we can picture the dynamic and enlivening power of God's being, drawing all of us to share the dance of God's eternal freedom and joy, an invitation held out to each and every one of us. We've come a long way from comparing God the Trinity to Mrs Rochester in the attic. Charlotte Bronte, who wrote the novel Jane Eyre, in which Mrs Rochester features, lived in a form of lockdown most of her life. Whether under the cruel regime of the school she attended, or under the strict oversight of her widowed father in Haworth Vicarage, Yorkshire, there might have been something autobiographic, autobiographical in the abnormality of the woman locked away for years on end. And we have all had a taste of that in recent months and can sympathise. But if Charlotte knew such abnormality, I think it's fair to assume that she also knew a deeper normality undergirding it. It was a normality that her father preached about every Trinity Sunday and which Charlotte came to believe in. It was the permanent normal of the deeply fulfilled and overflowing life of God as Father, Son and Spirit, a life which you and I are invited to share. Come and feast, says Rublev's snapshot of God. Come and dance, says Ravel's glimpse of God. Whatever might or might not change after Covid-19, whatever your hopes for the future after this strange time, this one feature of normal will not change and will be permanently open to us. So now it's up to you and me. Are we prepared to step forward and join the circle of eternal love? Are we ready to discover with Saint Ephraim that it is a beautiful adventure to desert to God? Amen. intercessions tonight are written by Martin Luther King Jr. The language is a bit dated but the subject matter is acutely contemporary. The images come from our dear friend Chaz Howard from a protest this week in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. May we pray. O oh, thou eternal God, out of whose absolute power and infinite intelligence the whole universe has come into being. We humbly confess that we have not loved thee with our hearts, souls and minds, and we have not loved our neighbours as Christ loved us. We have all too often lived by our own selfish impulses rather than by the life of sacrificial love as revealed by Christ. We often give in order to receive. We love our friends and hate our enemies. We go the first mile but dare not travel the second. We forgive but dare not forget. And so as we look within ourselves, we are confronted with the appalling fact that the history of our lives is the history of an eternal revolt against thee. But thou, O oh God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us for what we could have been but failed to be. Give us the intelligence to know thy will. Give us the courage to do thy will. Give us the devotion to love thy will. In the name and spirit of Jesus we pray. Amen. O God, our eternal Father, 
we praise thee for the gifts of mind with which thou hast endowed us. We are able to rise out of the half realities of the sense world to a world of ideal beauty and eternal truth. Teach us, we pray thee, how to use this great gift of reason and imagination so that it shall not be a curse but a blessing. Grant us visions that shall lift us from worldliness and sin into the light of thine own holy presence, we pray. Amen. Most gracious and all-wise God, before whose face the generations rise and fall, thou in whom we live and move and have our being, we thank thee for all of thy good and gracious gifts, for life and for health, for food and for raiment, for the beauties of nature and the love of human nature. We come before thee painfully aware of our inadequacies and shortcomings. We realise that we stand surrounded with the mountains of love and we deliberately dwell in the valley of hate. We stand amid the forces of truth and deliberately lie. We are forever offered the high road, yet we choose to travel the low road. For these sins, O oh God, forgive. Break the spell of that which binds our minds. Purify our hearts so that we may see thee. O oh God, in these turbulent days when fear and doubt are mountain high, give us broad visions, penetrating eyes and the power of endurance. Help us to work with renewed vigour for a warless world, for a better distribution of wealth and for a brotherhood that transcends race or colour. In the name and spirit of Jesus we pray. Amen. O loving Father, from thy hands have come all the days of the past. To thee we look for whatever good the future holds. We are not satisfied with the world as we have found it. It is too little the kingdom of God as yet. Grant us the privilege of a part in its regeneration. We are looking for a new earth in which dwells righteousness. It is our prayer that we may be children of light, the kind of people for whose coming and ministry this world is waiting. Amen. Oh, 
final blessing. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.